What an absolute privilege it is to come to you with the word of God today. I pray that you uh, would share this message, would subscribe, would lock in fully to what God, the Holy Spirit is saying to us today. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. And we believe that the entrance of your word brings light in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, how that the anointing destroys every yoke of oppression and bondage in the lives of your people. Uh, today, uh, friends, we're gonna be talking about living on purpose. And the subtitle is part two of a particular set of skills. I'm reminded when I was watching a movie one time, a man's daughter was kidnapped and he spoke with the kidnapper on the phone and he's like, I don't know you and you don't know me, uh, but I have a particular set of skills and I will find you. Well, today in this age, in our culture, we need to live on purpose. And not only living on purpose, but we need men because as we're talking about living on purpose, we're addressing the family and we've gone back to the beginning where God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish, over the birds, over every living thing that creeps on the earth. And so God blessed man, male and female, he created them. And so in the beginning, uh, when God created man, he created man, male man, and female man. We later see in Genesis chapter two that God now forms man from the dust of the ground. And then he separates Eve later on from Adam, separates rather the woman from the man. Paul tells us that Adam was formed first. Form is for function. So when we're talking about living on purpose, uh, there is a function that needs to be fulfilled. There's a function that needs to be performed. And why did God make man differently than he made the woman? Uh, God spoke to the ground, formed man from the dust of the ground, but he formed the woman from the man, from his side. And so uh, men, uh, you can look at them and see that they're different. I know the world is trying to say that men and women are the same and anything uh, a man could do, a woman could do just as good or better. And that's the biggest lie, uh, but it's politically correct. And so I guess it's just a politically correct lie, but it's a lie. Uh, we're different. And as we're in the Olympics, uh, when men are competing as women in certain sports, men have 40 to 30% more upper body strength than men, than women, I'm sorry. Men have 40 to 30% more upper body strength than women. Uh, men, uh, the way they see things is different. The way the brain uh, is wired, there are differences in the way men perceive and the men process than the way women do. Women are naturally better at multitasking than men. I can't keep up with my wife when she's multitasking. I mean, I could be uh, watching t TV, and if I'm watching the TV, all the other noise falls down. So if you're talking to me, if I'm doing something, I'm not trying to ignore you, I just can't hear you. But my wife has, she, you know, she can be cooking, uh, she could be uh, working, uh, you know, texting at the same time, talking to somebody, and then she knows what I'm doing at the same time. And, while she's doing all this, she can be asking me about what I'm doing. She's built differently, and I thank God for that. They're different, uh, but there's not a difference in value. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that God made men and women both heirs of the grace of God, both given dominion. Uh, and again, I said it before and I'm gonna say it again. When God gave man dominion, he did not give man dominion over people. Read the Bible. It says they had dominion over uh, the earth, over the fish, over the birds, over the things that creep. But God never gave man dominion over another human being. That's why it is against God's word against God's nature for a human being to try to control another person because God gave everyone dominion. And so we have dominion, but not 
to dominate another human being. A man does not have dominion over a woman. Let me make it clear. Man does not have dominion over a woman. We're built differently and that is for the function. And so in Genesis 2, we see God formed man from the dust of the ground. Paul says Adam was formed first. There is a significance in being formed first. Why? Because the first always belonged to God. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter three, uh, you know, it says, honor the Lord with your substance, with the first of your increase. Abel, he gave God in Genesis, we see Abel giving God an offering and Abel gave God his first. So the first male lamb was to be offered to God. And when uh, the children of Israel came into the promised land, remember, they came into the land of Jericho. Jericho was the very first city that they conquered. And what God said is that everything was to be set apart. So they weren't supposed to, you know, take any of the spoils of Jericho, all the gold and uh, the silver and all the uh, loot that they would find as God gave them the city of Jericho when the walls came down, all of that was to be devoted unto God. So the first city that they conquered belonged to God. And then Israel was able to enjoy the rest. Remember in Genesis chapter, I'm sorry, in, in, in Joshua uh, chapter, uh, I believe it's chapter six, we see uh, there's a man by the name of Achan who did what was detestable uh, because he took what God said was first that belonged to him. And uh, I'm sorry, it's in, it's in Joshua chapter seven. We see the story of Achan. Uh, when they went to go and conquer the second town, they were allowed to enjoy the produce and the increase of that. But there was a problem. Someone in the camp appropriated for themselves what God said belonged to him, what was first. And when they went into battle, the entire nation was cursed and they couldn't win in war because the first belongs to God and they appropriate it for themselves. So the tithe is actually the first of your increase. That's why it's inappropriate for you to just take care of all your needs, pay all your bills, and then afterwards say, okay, now what is it left for me to give to God? because God does not do second place. God says you're not gonna have any other gods before me. God is preeminent. Uh, he is uh, to be honored and respected and we honor God with the first of our increase. In the children of Israel in their ceremony, they understood uh, that the first crops belonged to God, even the firstborn son belonged to God. So when the death angel came, uh, they needed to kill the lamb uh, because the firstborn was going to be sacrificed, was going to die. And so they sacrifice the Passover lamb so that the firstborn could live. Uh, that's why Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren, and he is the Passover lamb, and he's sacrificed so that the blessings of Abraham can come upon the Gentiles. So, the God, so God sent Jesus for him to bless us. How did he bless us? Because he was sacrificed for us that we might enjoy the blessing. So the first, Adam is formed first, has to be sacrificed. That's why it's the man's responsibility to lay down his life for his wife. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The first always has to be sacrificed. And when the first is sacrificed, when you give God what is first, seek ye first the kingdom of God, then every other blessing follows. Fail to honor God first, then we invite the curse. And the Bible says the curse without a cause cannot come. And so uh, we see that the whole earth is cursed 
when the man who is formed first is not sacrificed or his heart is not turned toward God, if the heart is not circumcised before God, the Bible says, unless I turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, if that does not happen, the whole earth is going to be affected by the curse. And so when we see, as it says in Second Chronicles, uh, that the locust is devouring the land, I shut up heaven that there is no rain, uh, there's pestilence, there's disease. Uh, God says, if my people who are called by my name, God looks to his people first. Judgment even begins first at the house of God. The first always belongs to God. The first has to be sacrificed. Adam is formed first and is a part of his function. And we see Adam is given first instruction. The Bible says that uh, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. Why? Uh, because God tells Adam uh, in Genesis uh, chapter, chapter two, he gives him first instructions. He took man, put him in the garden, Genesis 2.15, and he put him there to tend and to keep it. To cultivate, to dress up, beautify the garden. And he had the responsibility to keep, guard, or protect. Why? Because he's first had first instructions. And so as the first, it's his responsibility to guard against any threat that would come and destroy the garden. God called you to protect, to guard. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of the flow, the issues of life. There are some things that are valuable that must be protected. That's why uh, you need to guard it because it speaks that there's something of value that needs to be protected. Who is going to protect the ones that are most vulnerable? The Bible says we give honor in 1 Peter chapter 3 to our wives as the weaker vessel. They're an heir of the grace of God in the same way, but physically they're built, their function is different. And God formed man with the ability to protect. That's why you have 30 to 40 percent more upper body strength than a woman, because it's your job to keep, to protect, to guard. And when you are out of place, the family is vulnerable. Women are vulnerable. Who is going to uh, protect the children when the man is not there? Talked about the lion in the lion pride. Uh, yeah, he might be the alpha in the pride. He might eat first, but you better believe when the hyenas come, it's his job to protect the pride. We have to fight. The man has to be the first to fight because there's a threat. There's something that's coming after the family. There's something that's coming after the will and purposes of God. There's something that's coming after uh, God being glorified uh, the way he ought to be. And it's a good fight of faith. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And so we need to know how to fight. We need to have uh, that set of skills that we're talking about. First to fight. Interesting, in Judges chapter 20, verse 18, the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God to inquire of God. They said, which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin? Uh, because Benjamin was protecting evil uh, that needed to be dealt with. Benjamin was allowing injustice to thrive. And God is not uh, okay uh, with women and children uh, being killed, being taken advantage of. And so there was a word sent out throughout all the tribes of Israel, but Benjamin refused to do anything about it. And so now there's a civil war 
and they have to go to war against Benjamin. Who's going to go first? The Lord said Judah first. Notice he says Judah first because Judah has rulership. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Rulership, authority, leadership. So Judah has to go first into battle. Isn't it interesting that Judah means praise? The praisers and the worshipers send Judah first. Judah is first. The first is responsible to go ahead into battle. Fighting is unavoidable. unavoidable. And as a man, you need to have the fight in you. If you are even going to provide for your household, God told man, uh, even in the beginning, that he is going to eat by the sweat of his brow. That is why if a man does not work, he cannot eat. And if a man does not work to provide for his own household, he is worse than an unbeliever. Jesus says, I work because I see my father works. Work what is called today. We have to fight to get up, uh, to go to work to provide, uh, to bring an increase, to prosper. Uh, prosperity doesn't just come and fall on our lap. No, it's a result of discipline, of effort, of toil, of sweat, of tears. Uh, then after, uh, after we've worked, then we can enjoy the fruit of our labor. We fight to provide. Some of you men, you need to get the hustle back. Give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids until we get out of debt. We got to fight. And when you lose your fight, you go broke. When you lose your fight, poverty comes in, sickness comes in. Why are we seeing so much curse? Because so many men have lost their fight. They become passive, like Adam who sits by like a bump on a log, watching his wife get taken advantage of. The only one thing that's worse than a Jezebel spirit, in my opinion, and that's the spirit of Ahab. Jezebel was married to Ahab, who knew what Jezebel doing, was doing was wrong. Ahab saw fire come down from heaven when Elijah prayed, and Ahab was a person who was a wishy-washy, passive man. We have too many of those men that are bringing pain and devastation in families and in communities. Get your fight back. Get your fight back, man of God. You might have been discouraged, but it's not over. You still got fight in you. I, I love the Rocky movies uh, because uh, Rocky, in his movie, he, he's a fighter. He's a fighter. And he says, it's not how hard you get hit. And no, he says, no, let me get it right. He says, it's not how hard you hit. It's how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. You need a fighting instinct in you to keep moving forward uh, when you're facing discouragement, when you're seeing challenges, when there are people who are up against you, when there are threats coming at you. You need to have the fight in you. Fight the good fight of faith, Paul tells Timothy. He uses strong language to Timothy, who was seemingly raised by women because he refers to the faith of women when he's talking to Timothy. But he says, Timmy, Timothy, although you are raised by women, you got to fight. Don't let anyone despise your youth. How you be an example. You fight to be an example. How there are some things you have to press through, but that's all right. We're going to press through. Get your fight back. How? Why? Uh, it requires a particular set of skills. Let me get into this word here. Uh, in order to raise your family or to bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, it takes a man, it takes a father with some fight in him. Uh, foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. I know that well. My father fought to get foolishness out of me. Ah. Uh, Training is painful. Uh, that, that's a painful process uh, to train and to teach your children to bring the Word of God uh, to the place of preeminence that it belongs in your life and in your family. It's painful 
Discipline is painful, but Proverbs 3.12 tells us whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Jeremiah 31, 18, I love this. It describes me so much. He says, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. You have chastened me, and I was chastened like an untrained bull. Uh, the bull is untrained. The bull is stubborn. The bull might be strong, but untrained. Uh, you want the bull uh, to plow. You want the bull to do the work, but the bull wants to do something else. And you would yoke that bull, that untrained bull, with a stronger trained bull. Uh, so that when the untrained bull says, no, I want to go and do my own thing, yank him back. Uh, you, you, you need training uh, because without training, we give in to the flesh. Without training, we give in to circumstance. Without training, we yield to emotions. We just yield to whatever uh, the flesh or the wind dictates. Uh, but when you are trained, you're able to stand in this evil day having done all. You're standing. Uh, you were like an untrained bull. I, I was stubborn. I'm glad I had a father that was more stubborn than me had to say, no, you're not going into sin. No, you're not going to just do whatever you want with a girlfriend. You don't even need a girlfriend, first of all. No, you're not going to be uh, uh, staying all night. No, you're going to serve the Lord. I don't care if I have to bring down the house. In this house, we will serve the Lord. It takes a real Joshua to say that. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I let the men of excellence stand up. Let the men of excellence stand up and say, we're going to fight. You know, uh, back in the Middle Ages, to be a man of nobility, to be a man of excellence, you had to be able to fight. Absolutely. They were trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. To be a knight, a person who was respected, a person who could serve the king, you were trained in fighting. And that's what set them apart from ordinary men. We see in Genesis chapter 14 that Lot was taken captive. Now, Abram heard that his nephew Lot, his brother's son, was taken captive. He armed his 318 trained servants. You remember the untrained bull? Uh, these servants are no longer untrained. They were trained servants who were born in his house. And so when Lot was taken captive by the enemy, Lot, remember, he separated. Abraham went out of Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan in Genesis chapter 11, verse 31, 32, and he dwelt in Haran. His father dwelt in Haran. And then in Genesis 12, God says to Abraham, get out of your house. And Lot traveled with his uncle Abram to the promised land, but Lot, because Abraham had the blessing of God on him, uh, became, profit, became prosperous by association. And when Lot became prosperous, there was a contention, and Abraham said, look, we don't need strife. Uh, you go right, I go left, you go up, I go down, whatever you decide, uh, but let there be peace between us. And so Lot separated from Abraham and went to live in Sodom. And that's where he was taken captive. Uh, but when Abram heard that his nephew was taken captive, I believe Lot left before he got trained properly. Lot left before he was trained. Abram, he's a man of faith. God bless Abraham. And we know that the blessing of Abraham is coming upon us, the Gentiles, but we need to know what Abraham knew. Abraham, the father of faith. Abraham, the man who did not waver in unbelief. Abraham, the one who was willing to sacrifice his own soul, his own son. Abraham, the one whom God said, in blessing, I will bless you and in multiplying, I will multiply you and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham, this righteous man that we talk about, knew how to fight. He had a particular set of skills. Ah, ah, you couldn't just do whatever you want because Abraham knew how to fight. One of the things I believe that we need to teach our sons as men is how to fight. Abram knew how to fight. 
And that's what said him. How, how are you going to protect when you don't know how to fight? How are you going to guard your family against the spirit of sickness and disease? How are you going to guard your family uh, against poverty, against strife, against any spirit that would want to come in there if as a man you don't know how to fight and you just need the women to pray? No more passive men. No more men like Abraham, like, like, like I'm sorry, like Adam who sits by and watches his wife take, be taken advantage of. We need men who can stand up, who can engage, who can fight who know how to stand in this evil day, who know how to appropriate the armor of God. Uh, David, uh, the reason why uh, he, was, he, he went against Goliath, he said, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm skilled. I don't know about that other armor, but I know how to use this sling. I'm trained how to use this sling. And I can take out Goliath the same way I took out the lion and the bear. We need men with training, trained to fight. That set Abram apart. And that's what's gonna set you apart as a man of God. Uh, it's interesting. Some things we don't realize about our pastor is that he's a trained boxer. He's a trained golden glove boxer. And when you know how to fight, you walk with a different type of confidence through life when you know how to fight. When you understand how to fight, you understand if someone puts their hands on you, you can end the fight quickly. You're able to stand in an evil day because you're trained how to fight. We need to learn how to fight again. We would, in the neighborhood, fight each other all the time. We would play fight, we would slap box, we would wrestle, we would body slam, we would, we would, we would suplex one another. We did that all the time, testing our strength as young men. But there was one dude in the neighborhood that we never messed with. The dude was a trained black belt. And while we would fight one another, we never tested him because we understood that whenever he fought, if he were to fight, we would be broke. Uh -oh. Something would get broken on the inside. We would be in the hospital. And so we didn't mess with people like that. Uh, a lot of these young men uh, that are shooting each other, a lot of times they shoot innocent victims uh, because they're not trained in how to use a weapon. They're not skilled. They're not skilled in combat. A lot of Casualty takes place when people are untrained and they're not skilled. When you don't know how to pray, when you don't know how to go into the Word of God and address some things, uh, you're not skilled in the Word that produces righteousness according to Hebrews 5, uh, 14. Uh, there's a skill that we need to develop as men if we're going to guard and to protect and to keep those things that are valuable. God tells the one who's formed first, it's your responsibility to step up and protect. Let's rise to the occasion as men of excellence. God bless you. Until next time.